Welcome to Planet of the Associations. I'm Seth Kahn. And I'm Mark Levy. And we're glad you're here. We're going to be talking about springboard stories, storytelling, insight, magic, all kinds of interesting things today. But we'll always bring it back to associations because the focus of this video blog is to provide value to C-level association executives, but to do it by playing around on the periphery where innovation happens so that you have new ideas, new insights, new things to think about when it comes to creating value in your association. So uh, in our last episode, we you were talking about springboard stories and the importance of springboard stories in order to kind of capture an insight to spark or, action right to spark action and how do you go about um what's the what's the engine that drives the springboard story uh, first off, there you have to know what is the change that you're trying to create. So you have to know what is the action that you want people to take after they hear the springboard. And then the story itself becomes the, the mechanism for making that happen. Okay, gotcha. And how big of an insight, uh, pardon me, how big of an, a see, I'm already tipping my hand. I'm barely listening to you because I know what I want to say. Magician, that's, that's magic jargon. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, um, I'm just waiting for a good time for me to insert what I want to say. <laughs> I'll keep going. That's How, not active listening, Mark. That's not active listening. Right, exactly. <laughs> I'm inactively listening. Um, how do you how do you know what the action should be? Like how big it remember I said about the magic trick. You need to be able to demonstrate that you create miracles and it can be a total solution for someone when you're speaking to them, or it can just be a piece of the solution. That's when I talked about case studies. It's like, oh, you can't do a case study. Tell me. And right. I'll, I'll create this miracle with your own stuff. Right. Right. right and in there. Right. So um, I want so the action that the springboard springboard story creates. Is it the whole enchilada or is it just a piece? It's, well, it's a call to action. So the action that you want is something is you, you, you're trying to convey an idea that the springboard story is used in organizational change. And so the insight that you want the listener to have is really what's the essence of the change and how can they uh, do whatever uh, their role is in affecting that change. Okay. What would be another example, even if we're just making one up right now of a springboard story? Yeah. So uh, another example, I worked in Royal Dutch Shell and I helped them with a $20 million change initiative. They wanted to put uh, technology down underground, down hole, they call it, in their oil and gas fields so they could map the oil and gas fields. And there was a lot of resistance at the time to doing that. People felt like that that was being foisted upon them by headquarters, that it was a bureaucratic move, that it wasn't going to help them ring the cash register more often than they were already ringing it. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted a springboard story that would say to them, this is the most important thing that Shell is doing right now. And you have a chance to be part of it. This is where we're using technology to map these oil and gas fields underground. And so what was the, what was the story? So at Shell, the springboard story was we'd actually went to a competitor, right? Because uh, Mobile and Exxon and BP had already put uh, technology down underground. And we told this, this, the story basically went like this, you know, you, did you know that it is just as expensive to find an oil and gas field as it is to mine it? So if you're out there, I mean, I mean, it's just as expensive to find it as it is to build the rig to mine it. So let's say it costs $30 million to build a rig. It's also going to cost about $30 million to find the place to stick the straw in the ground and suck the oil and gas out. But once you get there, how much oil and gas can we pull out of that? Right. So what is Shell? I'm not actually telling the springboard because it's uh, I'm telling you the whole story. So, so I'm, I guess I feel like the need to kind of tell a little bit about the oil and gas industry sure. to explain the springboard. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so what Shell does to avoid that initial cost up front is that they buy oil and gas fields from a smaller company that's already found them. And then they sell off the oil and gas field because when the oil and gas comes out of the ground, it follows a hump shaped curve. When you first find it, there's very little coming out. Then you figure out how to tap it and then it grows and grows and then it starts to go down again. And then it, there's at the tail end, it, it's, it's not even worth it to stick around. You sell it to some smaller refinery at that point. So what Shell said is if we could expand 
the, 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 peer, the span where we have oil and gas coming out by just a little bit on both ends, we'd make a boatload more money. But the only way we can do that is if we know what it looks like down there. Because oil and gas fields look really complicated. I used to think it looked like an upside down balloon. That's what that's was my image of an oil or gas field. But it looks, some of them look more like a bowl of potato chips where every chip is, a, is an oil or gas deposit. So think about how would you stick a straw into a bowl of potato chips and suck all the chips out? Well, you couldn't do it unless you knew exactly where every chip was. And that's what our technology would allow you to do. So there's, there's the springboard. So, oh. so say the springboard again. So imagine if we knew exactly where the oil and gas was underground by, by uh, using this technology, it would allow us to expand the amount of time that we had the oil and gas field and the amount of oil and gas we could extract from it by a significant amount in every single oil and gas field we already own. Imagine how much more oil and gas that would bring to the cash register. What if we did that? Right. And when would they, when would they, and so, so I can really see like that this story, a springboard story has a very specific audience and it might be internal. Yes. You don't really, the same way you just said to me was, I feel the need to set context. So you better understand the springboard story. That means the real springboard story when it was used, it wasn't for outside consumption. That's it was right. purely an internal driver. So um, uh, how do you, like, how do you use the springboard story? Like, like tactically, like what's it? Well, you know, see, here's the, here's you know, the, who uses it. Yeah. yeah. So as many people as you can get to use it, as you want it to spread, you want it to go viral because that's its power. That's, that's what, that when we were leading change at the World Bank in knowledge management, we realized that we could convince one person at a time, right? Over lunch but there are 12,000 people at the World Bank. So that's 12,000 hours before everybody understands what you're doing. So we were trying to figure out how to get it to spread like gossip. We wanted it to spread at the speed of gossip. And so the story is so short that it's easy for someone to remember. And it's so pertinent that people feel compelled to share it. And so the power of the springboard story is not in the one-to-one -one transmission when you tell it, it's that your listeners pick it up and tell it to their friends who tell it to their friends who tell it to their friends. And so it grows exponentially. Right. It's word of mouth marketing. Yep. Word of mouth right? marketing. It's, yeah. And a very it's, smart package. The springboard story is this very smart package. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's this idea of uh, I was just working with an organization today, as a matter of fact, on their mission, vision, and values. And I, I have this rule of, of unless people can remember it and they want to talk about it, but a key point, remember it, like remember the idea. To me, it doesn't do anyone any good whatsoever. Right. So even when we had even when we had this wonderful mission written out and it was beautiful, it was a great mission. Like it was great. Um, when I was asked to explain it, I just picked out one or two sentences from it, you know, and I said, here's what the thing, and I extrapolated on it from there, but it was the idea of, yeah, that's the thing people are going to remember that I right. can remember everything from it. So to me, memory is such an important part of the leadership game. <laughs> it is. What you say needs to be remembered and that you need to, to create for memory. You need to give people memory pegs. You need to give them short sentences. You need to give them like analogies that they can use. You need to, you know. What's a memory peg? Uh, um, uh, you need to show them... Uh, like how they're going to remember it, right. like how to go about remembering it, like an analogy or so. Yeah, I, I'll give you an, uh, an um, like an example today, an analogy or so. I was listening to uh, John Maxwell. Some of you know John Maxwell, and he has these videos, Minute with Maxwell. And today's video was about routine. And, you know, it's just that, that, I don't remember anything that John Maxwell said in the minute, except for this. He said, he said something like, he said, now I'm this creative guy. I'm very creative, but I still have routines and I don't think routines stifle me. A routine is like a freeway. 
And if you want to get to someplace much faster, you have to take the freeway. And you know what I mean? Like that idea yeah. of a freeway is like a predefined road, you right. know, rails and concrete. Like you can't just improv into a freeway, you know? Right. Freeway. So it's like, that's his routines. And that really was a beautiful case for routines. A routine's like the freeway. You don't have to take the freeway. Right. You know, but if you want to get somewhere fast and predictably, it's like, then take the freeway. So, uh, you know, leaders need to think like that. Um, uh, I think it's really hard to think like that when you're inside. You know, I, I know a lot of times when I ask an, uh, someone like on the C-level team to tell me what's the mission of their organization. And I don't mean the verbatim memorized version. I mean, you know, what are you about? Just Just give me a few sentences. What I discover is that it's filled with jargon. There's all kinds of embellishments that you wouldn't really understand unless you were on the inside, either the inside of the sector or the inside of the organization. And I can listen to them. And then I can turn around and talk to a total stranger and say, this is what they're about. And I can do it in you know half a sentence, right? Same right. way you can with your differentiation. You interview someone, you ask them a lot of questions. I know this because you did it with me, right? right? You ask them a lot, a lot, a lot. You go through all this stuff and then you're able to pour back something that says, here's what you said that's compelling that gets to the essence. And right. you know, right. for me, it's like buried in all the other stuff. I don't see it. It's like I see everything swimming around in there together. Well, it, see, one of the benefits, you and I listen to these things as outsiders because people who are inside, they think everything is of similar importance. You know, like everything is equal weight, but it doesn't. You know, listening to it, I'm listening for color. It's like, boom, that's what they're going to remember. Great. You can say everything that you want to say. You just can't say it all at the same time. <laughs> if you try to say it all at the same time. People aren't going to take anything uh, from it. It's like when I'm uh, uh, teaching organizations about uh, uh, about talking about their business or about elevator speeches and things like that. And, you know, it, it's it, I say it's like. Imagine that you're uh, uh, like you're taking everything you sell, all your goods, all your products and services or so, and you're like thrusting them at the listener. And you're saying, here's all the stuff I do. Make meaning from this. Now, the listener is too busy trying to make meaning of their own life. They have no, they're not, they have no desire to sit there and make meaning. Like that's your job. You right. should have made meaning about who you are and what you bring to the world before you got to them. Don't make them have to pick through all your stuff and tell you what it means. Like right. that's a horrible, it's, you know, a very selfish and lazy way to be. Like you make the meaning first and you get your foot in the door and you can bring all that other stuff in behind you after. You know, you don't have to get rid of it, but you do have to lead with something. And that kind of, I, I just feel very strongly about this, this idea of whatever it is you as a leader are talking about needs to, you need to think about what's memorable here and what are people going to be talking about? I just, I, I mean, there, there's very little else I feel as strongly of when it comes to the work that I do about that. Uh, I'll be speaking to people say, okay, yeah, no one's going to remember that. Like, and they'll say, oh, but it's important. It's like, I'm sure it is. They're not going to remember it. <laughs> like, you know, so it does, it does you no good. Like it does you no good. It actually um, does you bad, right? Because it clutters everything else up. Right, right. So that, um, to kind of take a little step there, what I wanted to talk about from last time was the idea of insight, because you were talking about the springboard story, springboarding into action, and you talked about this idea of insight. And so it's also super important that your speeches, that what it is you do, your emails, that they all be loaded with insight. And right, because to it's this idea that that if people, if you only tell people what it is that they already know they have no reason to listen to you, that you need to tell them new things. Not everything has to be new, but you've got to tell them new things, right? And so you have to surprise them so that they definitely keep listening. And by the way, even if you're their boss, they don't necessarily listen to you. This right. is still an aesthetic. I don't care that you're the CEO. 
you know, right. I've said the same piece of advice to someone 400,000 people under them. Like it's, you still have got to surprise them with what it is so that they pay attention. They go, ah. And so an insight is, I don't know where this definition originally came from, but I read it in a book by Phil Dusenberry, one of my all-time favorite books. It's got two titles. The title in hardcover is called something, I, I don't know if we spoke about this before. Um, we Set His Hair on Fire was the title in hardcover. And in softcover, it was something like one great insights worth a thousand good ideas, something like that. So anyway, Duesenberry used to be the CEO of BB, BBDO, the ad firm. And so this is an entire book about the power of insights. And so Duesenberry said an insight is something that once you hear it, once you see it, you can't see the world in any other way. Oh, nice. That, right? That when you hear it, it changes how you see something entirely. Uh, I'll give you an example of it, uh, something I think of as an insight. So that book Mindset by Carol Dweck, you know, that insight is so great. It's that we, uh, we come to the world either with a fixed mindset where we think that who we are and our talents and our skills are, and everything that we are are relatively fixed. Like who we are now is who we're always going to be to a degree as we go on. And so if you have talent for something, you're really talented and you can do it. But if you don't have talent for it, like that's too bad, you, you're not going to be able to do it. And then there's the growth mindset. And so the growth mindset is is I may not have that talent yet, but I will get there, right? As long as I keep on trying. It's the difference between saying, oh, I can't solve this puzzle. I'm not good at puzzles and saying, oh, I want to solve this puzzle. And now that I solve this puzzle, I want a harder puzzle to solve because I want to grow, right? And so to me, that's an, that's a, that's an insight and communicating through insight. Another thing actually from the Phil Dusenberry book about insight that I found uh, so wonderful is he talked about how insight is best created or best disseminated in the situation in which it's going to be used. In other words, when the situation is important and active, if you give it, it at a different time in a passive situation, people may not listen to it. You could do it over and over again. But like when they really need it, that's when you deliver the insight. And so he gave this wonderful um, story about it. He said that he loved to play golf and he was a terrible golfer, except for one thing. He could drive the ball from the tee incredibly far. He always used the biggest club. He wound up tremendously and he could hit these monster drives off the tee, but they were never accurate. He would always pull them really far or slice them to the right really far. But nevertheless, he killed everyone else in distance. And so he was proud of that. He like identified with that. It's like, I'm the guy who can really drive. And people would always tell him, Phil, use a smaller club. Phil, don't wind up so much. Don't do these things. And he, he never listened to him, right? Because he wanted to drive the ball. One day he was playing in a tournament with pros. And so he was teamed up with a pro and he did what he normally did. He took a huge club. He wound up, he drove the ball and he, he pulled it into the weeds way down the fairway. And so he and the pro were in the weeds looking for the ball. They were searching, searching, searching. And so the pro, they finally found the ball after searching for a few minutes. And the pro said, Phil, before you pick the ball up, let me ask you this question. If you could pick that ball up and put it on the middle of the fairway, and it would have to be moved 50 feet further back towards where you started, but it wouldn't cost you a single stroke. Would you do that? And he said, pick it up without costing me a single stroke, put it in the very middle, but just move it a little bit back. Yeah, I would take that. And the pro said, that, was, that would be what would happen every time if you used a smaller club and you didn't wind up so much. And Duesenberry said, standing there in the weeds, it was boom. 
he instantly understood this thing that people were, tell, were telling him his whole life about golf, but no one had ever gotten through to him because here it was an insight because we were in the middle of what needed to be happened. Uh, right. Does that? Yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah. He was ripe for it at that moment. Tying he, the, the pro tied the lesson to the moment where he was most receptive to hearing it. And, and he framed well, it in a way that made it easy for him to understand. Well, that's right. Because the surprise. So sometimes the surprise of an insight happens in just delivering the insight itself. Like right. Just do it verbally. But other times the surprise of the insight has to do the, with the context, with w- when it's delivered or so. Right. So it got my ear when you were talking about the the um, springboard story and about an insight in the springboard story. I could imagine that that would wow people. It's like, oh, here's this thing that we didn't know. Right. That could make all the difference. What were you going to say? So when you take the idea of the message delivered in the right way at the right time, and you uh, connect that to this idea of wowing somebody when you have a moment, we talked in the last episode about the magic trick, that the magician has to be able to do a magic trick on the spot. They have to deliver the experience, not just tell people they're a magician. And we transpose that to the association world when you're talking to a potential member, right? Well, and by the way, the magician needs to be able to give the experience of astonishment, no matter what the circumstance. That's right. They can be surrounded on the street, you know, and they still, oh, you're a magician. Do something for me. Show me something. Same thing for for associations. And then connect that to this idea of of narrowing what it is you're going to share. You don't give them everything all at once right? Otherwise they have to sift through it and figure out where the value is. And they don't, they won't, they won't do that. They'll just ignore you. You take those three things and you put them together and you have a really powerful recipe for, uh, for making impact, right? And it's one of the things that I think performers really understand, right? Because, because uh, per, performance art is really the art of impact. It's, 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 you're, you're taking someone through a sequence of experiences that they really find enjoyable, And so you have to do all of that on the fly. You have to, you have to know, don't tell them this, do tell them that, find the stuff that's compelling, leave out the crap that's not, you know, all of that. And it feels to me like that's a skill set that C-level executives and associations could really use. Because what tends to happen is that they're specialists in their particular space. They know membership, they know education, they know finance. But what they don't know how to do necessarily, some do, but not all, is how to create an experience when someone is ripe for enrolling them in their organization in a way that that person will feel is, you know, compelling and smooth and is a continuation of the value that was generated for them that gave them that kind of wow experience. So that I think that's a super important skill set that comes really from the world of performance art, but is uh, has tremendous application in uh, leadership in associations. Yeah, this idea of creating an experience with the what's listener. The, what's the piece that you feel is unbelievably strong? It, it's it's knowing what to focus on, not giving them everything all at once. Right. Uh, creating in a moment of wow with whatever's at hand, whether you're on a busy street or in a in a, in a hallway in a hotel. Right. Um, and, and hitting, uh, and, and opening up the value conversation with the listener so that they're experiencing it. They're not being told about it. Right. Right. So it's combining all these things that we, yeah, which about. I think a performance artist do, I think a good performance artist has to do all of those things. Right. And a performance that's, you were a performance artist, right? Street theater, street theater, or a magician or a singer songwriter on the stage or whatever. You know, I liked my wife as a singer songwriter, Laura Barron, right? She, she does these amazing shows that she really shines on stage. And part of the magic is how she chooses the songs. She doesn't play all of her songs at once. You don't go to a show and hear four minutes and then it's done because you just heard 20 songs, right? In four minutes, it would be a cacophony, right? So, but what she she knows how to pick us, like she, she, she has one song that's incredibly, uh, you know, uh, deep and reflective and maybe even something that addresses something painful. Like I remember a song that she wrote about war once, you know, all our blood runs the same kind of thing. You know, it takes you into this really kind of somber 
uh, deeply emotional response place. And then she'll follow it up with something upbeat and light so that you can kind of break the tension and move in. And, and there's, you get this release, right? Because it's right. because she's architected the process through it. Well, that's often not the case when people are standing in a hallway in a hotel talking about their, you know, what's the value of joining their organization or something similar. Well, what you're saying r reminds me of in order to create this kind of amazing f experience for people, it is usually necessary that you get in close with them, that it be about their life, that you somehow are like really there with them. And I'll, I'll give you why it is I'm saying this. So I worked with uh, I co-wrote a book with Joel Bauer who the, the Wall Street Journal online called the chairman of the board of corporate trade show rainmaking and Wired Magazine said, watching 350 people at a conference line up on Joel Bauer's command to leave their personal contact information was, quote, a feat of mass obedience that must be seen to be believed, end quote. So that's Wired. So Joel, super cool. He's a magician. He's a pitchman. He's a, you know, he does all these things. And so I would follow Joel around because I wrote this book with him, watching him build these huge trade show crowds of 200, 400, 700 people for nothing, you know, with his competitors surrounding him with, you know, and no one knows who he is and whatnot. And suddenly he's got 500 people standing in front of him. It's, it's quite amazing. And so the way Joel would build crowds, even though he would eventually be up on an 18 inch high riser, in front of the Microsoft booth or the Mercedes booth or whoever he was, he was acting as the pitchman for before he would do that. He would actually go into the aisle of the Javits center or wherever it is the aisle in front of the booth, because he felt that it was too difficult to build a crowd from the stage that you were too distant. You were too far away. It was too easy for people to keep walking. Mm. So he would do something like ask to borrow someone's eyeglasses, and then he put it down in the middle of the walkway, in the middle of the aisle at the Javits Center in front of the booth. And he'd have people gather around, like forming a circle, staring at the glasses. And he said, you know, in a moment, we're going to try to use our minds to get these eyeglasses to move we're going to try to move them with our mind. And like he'd get there and he'd get this crowd of like 50 or 60 people there first. And he'd be talking to them and, you know, get, getting them excited. And the glasses would move. And then from that, he would then walk them over to the stage and up onto the stage. And then he'd start. But he said, like, it's best to start building the crowd like out there where they are. Right. Like on their level, I don't mean spiritually or anything yeah, like that. Right, right, right. You know, like it's where they are rather than you standing off as some oddity like out there, you know, above them or so. But very, uh, very interesting. But and by the way, I, I learned a lot from him. Uh, another interesting thing is when he would have this big crowd that he was building um, he would invariably have them step in closer, step in closer so that they could see better. But one of the reasons why he'd have them step in closer was that they were in tighter and now it was harder for them to leave. Ah. <laughs> so it's this idea, step in, step in, you're gonna, and then, you know, like suddenly you're, you have people all around you. You can't go. So very interesting stuff. It uh, is. It is. It reminds me of the kind of the carnival barker of old or, or you know, it's street theater. It reminds me of street theater. How do you pull people in? Right. Well, how did you do that in street theater? Well, you know, it's something I actually studied a lot. Yeah. How do you, there, there, I found that there were like these thresholds and I'm going to tell you about it next time because we're at the end of this episode. How is it that you capture people's attention and hold it? That's where we'll begin next time. I want to know that. I'm Seth Kahn. And I'm Mark Levy. We'll see you next time. Bye.